Good morning. Morning. Let's sing a couple songs and then I'll sing a song and then we'll hear some good preaching. There is I got a song that I just thought about I should probably do this morning. Seems like it's very appropriate. Some guy named Albert Brumley wrote it, but I really didn't don't think it would have he ever thought it would apply. Come and listen in to a radio station where the mighty host of heaven sing. Turn your radio on. Turn your radio on. If you want songs of Zion coming from the land of endless spring. Get in touch with God. Turn your 
radio on. Turn your radio on and listen to the music in the air. Turn your radio on, heaven's glory check. Turn your lights down low and listen to the master's radio. Get in touch with God. Turn your radio on. When I was, the Nats did something terrible this morning. When I was 18, I uh, went to the Citadel for a weekend to see if I wanted to attend there, and I did not. <laughs> but um, that Friday, it was, um, they have a, a Friday afternoon formation every, every week, and the PX was out of bug repellent. <laughs> and all those fellas had to stand at attention. Well. I was down on the field with them, and you couldn't see it up in the stands, but up in the, um, but down in the field, all you could hear was <coughs> Well, that's what you're going to hear a few times out of me, I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm from Pillion. Well, not from Pillion, but we lived there for 13 and a half years, and y'all know what this is, right? It's called the Pillion Wave. We're, um... We're going to have a deacon's meeting next Sunday afternoon, so we'll at least be here till um, next week, and we'll be able to tell you after that uh, what the deacons have decided, but we'll worship here at least until um, uh, one more week. When we do get ready to go in, Bill and Connor are working, are working really hard on um, to be able to live stream. That means that those of y'all who want to stay home, you can just um, watch it on YouTube live if we can work it out. But we're also going to um, use the FM transmitter and see if maybe those who don't want to go inside would like to sit in the parking lot and still listen to church from your car like you're doing now, uh, but only at the sanctuary. So we're going to have a lot of different options, we hope, for um, worship. And I promise you that safety is going to be a major concern. If you would, turn in your Bibles with me to the 95th Psalm, Psalm 95. And we're going to read God's Word this morning. Before we go to the Lord in prayer, we're going to read verses 6 and 7. Psalm 95, verses 6 and 7. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before our God, the Lord our Maker, for He is our God. And we are the sheep of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Pray with me for a moment, if you would, silently at first.
Father, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you in the glory of your nature. We have enjoyed this time. We know you as God, as maker, as Lord, as Savior, as Father. We know you as the lover of our soul. You are the just God, the true God. To you deserves, belongs all praise, all honor. To you belongs all love, for you are wonderful. Father, we ask this morning that your will be done, just as our Lord taught us to pray. That your will be done in our life, that your will be done in our mind that your will be done in our heart, in our home, that South Carolina be a state that obeys your will, that the United States of America be a holy nation that obeys your will. <clears throat> we pray that your will be done in all the earth. Bless our nation. Keep us safe from the attacks of the evil one who attacks us daily through television and internet, through song and radio, and always the devil comes to us and tempts us and tries us. And without your providence over us, we are undone. Lord, we pray for your will for our church. This church has seen trials and dangers. And we are a generation that's no different from the other generations. It's simply our turn. Even this virus is nothing new. 100 years ago, our, our church dealt with the same virus or the same, actually the same pandemic. We pray for your will for our personal walk, that we would obey you in all matters. And Lord, we pray for your healing, that you would heal our nation, heal our cities, that you would bring your grace to our president, to the many women who make up our Congress, that you would bless all those who make, a fit, make decisions that affect our lives, and Lord, that you would bless us in as much as we take actions that affect others. Use us for your glory. For we beg this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're at the end of a three-part. I love preaching series. I think I've told you that. I can preach a three-hour sermon or an hour-and-a-half sermon and just break it up into parts, and you get one part a week. I was joking that it's supposed to jump. It's only supposed to get up to about uh, 80 degrees by 10 o'clock, but by 11, it's supposed to jump up to 86. And I said, I probably will be finished before 11 o'clock. And Bill told me, he said, yeah, you will be, because if you're not, I'll be rolling the speakers away at 10 o'clock. <laughs> Two weeks ago, we began by saying that to worship God, we need to know the price he paid for us. We can understand God's love when we understand that he sacrificed his only begotten son for us, for our sins. And there are wonderful lessons to be learned from that. I said, when we know God's love, we can trust God's love, we can follow God's love, and we can copy God's love. Jesus said that is, that's the main point. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And last week, we considered the price that we have to pay to worship God. And y'all, if I get distracted, Connor reminds me that I'm bad to get distracted. If I get distracted, you got to realize i got a cloud of gnats around me. 
price do we have to pay? Well, you see, love is not free. While love is given freely, it always comes at a cost. Love is expensive because the one we love becomes so much more valuable, so much more precious than anything else. And we will pay any price because of our love. If we truly love God, it will cost us. There are a lot of people who don't love God. They go to church and they're, they're smooth and they're glib and they're charming. But if we love, it costs. I said last week, you can't have children and not understand the price of love. The things you have to do for love. If we love God, it's going to hurt. We sometimes forget that God works in us through times of trouble. We want our development, our growth to be easy. But it doesn't work that way. God grows us through trouble. And that the only way to follow Jesus, I said last week, is to follow his path. The path of the garden, which is where we struggle with God's call. Tell him we don't like the price, but then we decide to pay it anyway out of love. The path of the cross, where we go to our death serving God, his call, not ours. And the path of the grave, where we lose everything for God's sake. And in so doing, gain heaven. We gain a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So today I want to finish by asking a question. What does it take to be right with God? How do I know when I've taken the path of the garden, the cross, and the grave? How do I know that God is pleased with me? And what we've been looking at the past three sermons is that we have to get our heart right, our mind right, and our daily life right. A lot of people get their heart right. You know, your heart is not your emotions. Please don't make that mistake. In your Bible, your heart is your will. It's where you make choices. And you cannot be saved until you say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. When you stand up to a world of opposition and say, I am a Christian. That's the first step. And a lot of people have a hard time giving their heart to Jesus. But having given my heart, I have to make my mind right. What I think and what I do has to, have to be connected to my obedience to God. A lot of Christians have their heart right, but not their mind. They're not thinking of the things of God. I was taught in seminary that there's a long stairway going up the mountain in Jerusalem leading to the temple. And that there were people, the Jews would oftentimes pray a prayer on each step. It would therefore take them all day long to get upstairs. Imagine what would happen if you walked into our church, but you stopped and said a prayer on every step as you were going up. For one thing, it'd take you a long time. And you'd watch a multitude of people race past you. But where's their mind? While you're praying and getting ready to go to church, where is their mind as they hustle past you? Hang up their coat and get in the pew and start laughing and joking. We get our heart right, then we have to get our mind right. But there are a ton of Christians who never get their life right. We call them Sunday morning Christians. You know the people. They are Christian on Sunday, but Monday through Saturday, they live in the world. 
So I want to talk about those three things. If we're going to get right with God, we're going to learn to do those three things. Verse 1 says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Notice the call to pray says, O come. Because nobody can make you worship. You can be in church. You knew this when you were a child. Mama could drag you to church, but she couldn't make your heart be in it. The psalmist has to call to the people. Oh, come, join us. Worship. You understand you and your car could be full of the Holy Spirit, praising God, and the people in the next car could be thinking about something else. I told you about, I'm pretty sure I told you the story, but when I was a teenage boy, one Sunday night I put a transistor radio in my shirt pocket, ran an ear earpiece up to my ear and I was listening to the Baltimore Orioles in the World Series while my pastor was preaching. At one point, Brooks Robinson got a hit and I said, yeah! And I'm sure my pastor went to his grave thinking that he, he got my attention that one Sunday night. You have to choose. We have to choose to praise God. It's a choice. You don't just come to church and automatically worship God. You have to say, I'm going to worship God. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord, he says. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. You understand the rock of your salvation. Jesus talked about the house built on sand. But our faith is on the rock no storm, no waves can endanger us. The rock of our salvation. That is the, the word of praise that every Christian has. He or she can say, I am attacked on every side. I am pressed against by the world. But Jesus is the rock of my salvation. And that's reason to praise God. I'm locked up in the house, scared to death of the virus. Talking to one dear soul who went up to Tennessee on a vacation, wink, wink, and everywhere she saw were Yankees bringing the virus down with them, she th I thought. But no matter, Jesus is the rock of my salvation. What a word the Christian has. Like the old preacher who said, everybody worries about the end of time and the end of the world. He said, go to the end of the book in Revelation. We win. No matter what trials we go through, the Bible promises we will come out on the other end. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Now, actually, if you wanted to translate that literally, let's come before his face with a thank offering. Thanksgiving is not just words. It is an offering. <coughs> if I want to give thanks to the Lord, I have to offer a sacrifice from my heart, from my soul. But we know that, right? I remember last Mother's Day, I, I asked you the question, if you were a mother and you had two sons and one took a 10 carat diamond ring and flicked it to you and said, Happy Mother's Day. And the other one, maybe mentally retarded, took his hand and traced and colored a turkey on a piece of paper and put a heart over it saying, I love you, Mom. And I asked you, which gift would you love more? Thanksgiving without sacrifice, without an offering, is nothing. If we're going to worship God, we need to do it with our heart and our soul. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms, for the Lord is the great God and the great king above all gods. Now, the Jews knew that there were no other gods. So when the Bible says he's above the other gods, he's not saying they exist. 
we could easily retranslate this. He's a great God above all the false gods. You know, in the um, Hebrew, the word for idol is the word empty or worthless. Idols are worthless. The things we put so much interest in, so much passion towards, they're worthless. There is no value in this world except for God. In God's hand are the deep places of the earth. God owns the dark, deep places. And the heights of the hills are also his. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands form the dry land. All of reality belongs to God. And if I want to live in this universe, I have to recognize Almighty God. You see, we get our hearts right by praising God. The reason we're not right with God is we don't praise enough. When you have trouble, praise God. Our problem is that our God is too small. Not that the real God is too small. He's not. But our God sometimes is. Sometimes the God we pray to is a little bitty God. I talked to a fellow one time who said, well, I don't pray for things like that because God can't do it. But when we praise God, we figure out just how big he is. If you're depressed, if you're scared, if you're worried, start praising God. And after a while, the problems you face just won't be that big. The right heart seeks to please God. Look at this when it says, shout joyfully, give thanksgiving. The right heart is aware of God's presence. You know, the Bible promises that Jesus is here right now. Jesus says, where two or three are gathered together in my name. There I am in their midst. Jesus is here now. Have you even thought about that? I said that one time, and a 77-year-old grandfather slapped his 10-year-old grandson on the, on the shoulder, and they both sat up straight. <laughs> the right heart puts God above all others. Sometimes church is too much about personal profit. What's the preacher going to say that blesses me? What am I going to get from the choir? What's in it for me, we say in church? Church should be about God and what's in it for him and what can I do for him? Well, if we need the right heart, we also need the right mind. Oh, come again that call because you have to choose. Let us worship and bow down. When I quit thinking about me, too often we preachers are guilty of being Madison Avenue salesmen who tell you all the great things Jesus can do for you. And don't you want to buy in, we say? But shame on that kind of preaching, even when I do it. God is great and we must bow before him and do what's right for God. But I can't do that without humility. I have to get off my high horse. I have to quit asking, when are you going to get to the part that helps me? And I'm going to have to start asking, when can I do something for God? Y'all, we have a church because men and women of the past believed that we needed to build one. We wouldn't even have it if not for them. We have this beautiful place here because people in the past decided we needed to build this. What we have is a blessing that's been handed to us. What kind of blessing are we going to give? I think I told you all that I was surprised a few years ago when I read that it's nowhere in the Bible where it commands that you leave an inheritance to your children. But in Proverbs, we're commanded to leave an inheritance to our grandchildren. Not that we're supposed to skip our children, but that the gift, the inheritance we leave our children is so worthwhile that it lasts even beyond our children's lifetime. 
Are you worrying about, about the things that are going to last? Are you worrying about the things that are going to be important to your grandchildren in a hundred years? I know a lot of grandparents who don't even know if their grandchildren are saved. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is God. Why do we bow down? Why do we humble ourselves before God? Because he deserves it. He's God. I saw a bumper sticker a while back that said, if God is your co-pilot, you're sitting in the wrong seat. God should be the captain. God is the master. And my religion needs to get about him instead of me. And we are the people of his pasture. Now, the, the ancient Jews understood raising sheep. You would care for those sheep. You would put them in a pasture. You would protect them. They built stone pens to put them in at night. Pens that had no door. Just a doorway. And the shepherd would sleep in the doorway. So that if a wolf came or a bandit, he had to get through the shepherd before he could get to the sheep. Jesus says that he, was, he is the good shepherd. And that he gives his life for the sheep. We are the people of God's pasture and the sheep of his hand. Of his hand means of his possession. God owns us. Does God own you or do you think you own God? Who am I then? To get my mind right, I have to realize I am the child of God. I heard a family one time. The mother told her children, you're a Jones. Remember that. Well, folks, we are Christians. Remember that. The right mind claims God as maker. I exist in this universe because God made me. I am not trash. I am not a mistake. I am not an accident. God made me. The right mind realizes that he belongs to God. And the right mind seeks God's shepherding. Are you looking for God's blessing on your life? Well, if I've got my heart right, and I've got my mind right, now let's talk about mature Christian living. Let's get our life right, our daily life. This is where too many of us fail. We don't live as Christians through the week. Today, notice it says today. If you're going to make your mind up, you have to do it now. I've talked to a million people who, well, I'm exaggerating only a little bit. I've talked to a lot of people who have told me, I plan to get saved, but... Not right now. If you're not getting saved right now, you're, not lo you're lost. If you're not getting saved right now, you're headed to hell. If you're not obeying God now, you are in rebellion against God. If God has called you to do something and you're putting him off, you are rebelling against God. Today, if you will hear his heart, his voice, notice, if you will hear... Jesus preached the same thing when he said, those of you who have ears to hear, listen. Because he understood. A lot of people, the words go in here and go right out. If it's possible for you to listen, pay attention. Do not harden your hearts. That means harden your will. That means be determined. As in the rebellion, remember the Israelites rebelled against God. As in the day of trial in the wilderness. Don't be like the Israelites who rebelled against God saying it would be better to be slaves in Egypt than to be stuck out here dying. Sometimes we say it would be better if I lived in the world than if I suffered what it takes to be a true Christian. Don't do that, he says. When your fathers tested me, they tried me, even though they saw my work. When I was a little boy, it used to bother me. 
how the Israelites could see the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night and still rebel against God. How can anybody see the miracles of God and reject him? How can anybody watch a baby be born and not praise God? How can anyone see a life turned around because of Jesus and then walk away from God's will? But they got used to it. Forty years is a long time. They got used to watching the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. For 40 years, I was grieved. Now, a lot of translations translate grieve. In the Hebrew, it literally means disgusted. For 40 years, I was disgusted with that generation. Is God disgusted with us? He is if we're exercising our will and not his. And said, it is a people who go astray in their hearts. In other words, they choose sin. The great sin of our world today is not that the evil people do wrong. Not that the lost do wrong. The great sin of our age is that when Christians sin, when Christians disobey God, when Christians don't do God's will, and they do not know my ways. Now, he's not blaming them for ignorance. He's criticizing them for lack of Bible study. Do you know the will of God? You do if you read his book. If you don't read God's word, why not? So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. The rest of God, the peace of God, salvation, heaven. They shall not enter my rest. And they didn't get to go to the promised land. God freed those Israelites with 10 fantastic plagues. The destroyer passing over the houses, taking the firstborn of everyone who did not have goat's blood on their, the lentils of their door. Parted the Red Sea, closed it back up on the Egyptian army. I mentioned the pillars, the two pillars. And yet these people did not get to go into the promised land because they wouldn't believe in God. Y'all, I think there's a lot of Southern Baptists from, two, from 2020 who are going to die. And Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. You went to my church. You called yourself one of mine. But you're not entering into this rest because you rebelled. Choosing sin is to prefer the hope of salvation from the sin. We sin because we think somehow that sin's going to save us. Why does anyone drink? They drink because they think they're going to get a benefit from it. Why do people take drugs? They think they're going to get a benefit. That benefit is their salvation. Anything that I seek for salvation other than Jesus Christ is as dumb as alcohol or drug abuse. If you think you're going to save yourself with money, if you think you're going to save yourself with friends, with family, with fame, if you think you're going to save yourself with anything other than Jesus Christ, you're wasting your time. And you're as pathetic as the greatest dialect who's laying in the streets because he's lost everything due to his, his addiction. The Christian copies Jesus. Jesus says in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. This morning, is your heart right with God? Have you chosen him above all else? 
And if not, will you say right now, I choose Jesus Christ and I choose the way of God over the way of the world? Is your mind right with God? I know who I am. I'm not at the top. God is. And I'm his sheep, his beloved sheep. I'm his child, the one he loves. And will you get your daily life right? Monday through Saturday, will you act like it's Sunday? Will you act like it's the Lord's Day? God didn't give us the Lord's Day once a week so that we would only observe it once a week, but rather as a practice. We need to learn to live every day the way we act on Sunday. As always, if you want to contact us by YouTube, through Facebook, if you want to call me, you've got my phone number. Any way you want to contact us, we will work with you as you make your choice to follow Jesus. Thank you for worshiping with us. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are so wonderful. And we understand that everything we've done apart from you is a waste of time and foolishness. Foolishness to the point of dangerous living. For we have endangered everything we have, everyone we love, as we have while we have chased our sins. We love you, Father, and we thank you for your salvation through Jesus Christ. Now bless us and make us yours, not just in name, not just in deed, not just in thought, but in our entirety, that everything we own and everything we are and everything we do might be yours. For we must decrease and you must increase in our life. Bless us, strengthen us, and guide us. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.